So, um, team, should we introduce ourselves a little bit quickly first? So, um, Anthony? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so, I'm Anthony, uh, Deputy Chief Exec Strategy and Policy here at Culture Central. Nice to meet you all. Richard? Hello, I'm Richard Watts. I'm one of the directors at People Make It Work, and um, we'll be talking some more a bit later on. Great to see you. Charlene. Hi everyone, I'm Charlene Carter-James. I'm the Partnerships and Development Manager at Culture Central. And Ray, um, Ray Dean is our keynote, but I thought you'd want to say hi first, Ray. Hi everyone, nice to see you. I'm just scrolling. I'll speak more in a minute. <laughs> Fab. So thank you everyone for coming and showing an interest in Collective, which is Culture Central's um, I was leadership programme, but we're also talking about it as kind of a, like this collective um, and a, a space for us to make change as, as leaders in the sector. For those of you who may not have come across Culture Central before, Culture Central is a cultural sector support organisation. Um, we are a membership organisation, but we are also an Arts Council England investment principles support organisation. Our role is very much around convening, challenging and connecting to create opportunities through culture for people and places of the West Midlands. Um, as, as well as that, um, we have the priorities that we are delivering on for Arts Council around um, their investment principles, support, and that one of those is around inclusive, inclusivity and relevance. And this is where this programme has developed, um, where we identified through a number of our um, activities that we've done in the past through things like more than a moment things like the cultural response unit things like transforming narratives which Anthony will go through in a bit more detail about the rationale for that but how we found that this was a real gap and then in consultation with the team about shaping that and with people make it work so we know the work of people make it work has been fantastic and Rich is going to talk about and um, their approach and, and how that came about in a, in a second but we're really excited about this approach which I think is really different and and really and um, will hopefully really change the region as we start to move through this um, three-year program. Um, Anthony, did you have a next slide? You did, didn't you, for the agenda? So this is a bit of a structure for the day, uh, for the day, for the hour. Um, so um, we've got Radine speaking about her experience around leadership, um, and then we've got some detail about the actual program and the values around that, and then a bit of time for Q&A as well. Is there another slide, Anthony? I think that was it. Probably it on that one. I thought that was one. Excellent. So I'm going to hand over to um, Richard now to talk a little bit more about people make it work. And um, I'm going to pin you if that's all right. So I'm trying to do. Um... Oh, thank you very much indeed, Erica. Great to see you. And um, it's really brilliant to be here and to be have the chance to think together about what um, what we need in order to realise our leadership ambitions and how we can um, create a program together that um, gives us the support to um, be our best selves, realise the ambitions that we're setting for ourselves, the sector and the region, and um, to do that and also to provide that support to others, right? So I think one of the, the spirit of Collective is partly about the fact that we're better together, that it's easier when we're in a community. So People Make It Work is all about that, uh, as the name suggests. We've, we're an organisation that's been um, running for like 23 years, and we work with cultural organisations across the UK, mainly in England and Wales, theatres, galleries, orchestras, festivals, funders, um, orchestras, um, opera houses, um, community organisations. And we support all of them um, to create everyone's culture. So our vision is for everyone's culture made for, with and by everyone in our nations. And our job is to enable change, growth and transformation across the cultural sector. Um, and we do that with like, direct work with organisations in the region and across the UK and also with programmes. And those programmes are always co-created and co-developed. Um, so during COVID, we were running a programme called Culture Reset. Radine helped to de deliver that programme. Um, last year, we ran a programme called Freelance Futures um, that was focused on freelancers and supporting all of us who work in freelance ways. Um, and always we're working in um, co-created ways, enabling our voices 
to shape um, what we need, because we know that nobody knows better than each of us what we need in order to close some of those gaps. We've got a real, really strong focus on um, social justice, and uh, we have a director, Sandeep Mahal, who's our director of sector change. And um, this year, we've also um, been working with um, colleagues like Safina, who some of you might know, um, who we um, met when we were working with Culture Central last year. And she's been helping us to think about this programme, in fact, amongst some other things. She's apology, sending her apologies that she's not able to be with us today, but she will be present at, at particular points during the programme as well. So um, I, I mentioned that our name's People Make It Work, and um, it's really important that we all get our say. So um, we will be going through a formal co-creation process once the cohort for this programme has been selected in our first session. And Anthony will talk a, bit, a little bit more about some of those uh, dates and times later. But I just wanted to give an opportunity for everybody to, um, to uh, share any views that you want to share right now. I'm gonna pop um, a link in the chat. Let me just do that right away. So this is for um, a Jamboard that's live at the moment where you might want to share some of your views. Um, one of the reasons that we use Jamboard is that um, it enables us to um, uh, gather insight and views anonymously. So I'm just sharing the Jamboard in case it's not a format that's familiar to you. And you'll see that there's three questions that we're asking on this Jamboard. If you follow the link, I see quite a few people are already in there. You should find yourself in this space. We've got three questions that we're asking. The first is, are there some topics, themes and skills that you want included in the curriculum for collective? So if there are or some speakers or organisations that you'd really love to hear from, pop your initial ideas in here. We'll be spending more time on it in our first workshop. In order to do that, you just click here on a sticky note on the left hand side. It then opens up for you to write your note. Um, and then you choose a colour and press save. And the note that you've created then appears here. Um, so the first question relates to content, really. The second question, if you go to the top, you can move between slides, is whether there's any questions that you want asked on your behalf in the Q&A session later on this afternoon. So if you've got questions you wanna ask and you're happy to ask them, do that at that time live. But if there are questions that you'd like us to ask on your behalf, write them in here, use that post-it note button again. And finally, we're really interested in nominations as well as um, applications. So if there are people that you know should know about this program and would find it beneficial, and you think they'd be like a really great contributor and get value from it, then feel free to drop their names in here. Again, if, you'd if you're happy to send us an email with that information, you'd rather do it anonymously, there's the method to do it there. All right, so I'm going to um, stop talking, stop sharing, and um, I think I'm gonna hand over to um, Anthony, who's, oh no, I'm not, I'm gonna hand back to Erica and she's going to introduce our keynote. Thank you, I was new. I'm trying to do a million and one things at once now. And um, what I'll do is I'll, re I'll do the pin um, with, with Radine in a minute. So I'd really like to say thank you to Radine Carter, who is the um, creative director for Festival 23. Many of you might have also known Radine as the exec producer for Birmingham 2022 Festival as well. And um, yeah, she's going to talk to you about her leadership journey. I'm going to pin you. Thank you. Um, I can't see anyone. And I don't know what's happened to my screen, but it's OK, because I know what I look like and I've just seen all of you. So that's OK. But I'm hoping that this, I've got a couple of slides I just want to show you. I'm hoping they'll work. Um, so you'll have to shout out if you, if you can, can or can't see them. Um, but the first thing I just want to say is, yeah, I think I'm, I'm recognising some names in the room and it's really lovely to see, I don't know, people that I do the work with really closely or that came through the festival last year that are sort of still around, I think, and still on this culture thing, which is amazing. Um, and I think probably, um, 
you're all here obviously because you're interested in going on this leadership journey or nominating somebody which is amazing and so therefore i think i would say that you're probably already leaders in some way or you're on a journey in some way um and so i'm, I'm i guess what i want to do keynote sounds a bit fancy for me but i think what i what i thought might be helpful is to share why i think experiences like this are quite helpful on that journey um and how probably on reflection i've taken quite a long journey through various roles i never did a course like this but i kind of wish i had um but how maybe i've made up some of those experiences in slightly different ways over a really long period of time when you could do it in quite a short uh, space of time um so the, the other second thing i wanted to say is that again when thinking about what i would say today is that in my role right now as erica said i'm, I'm creative director for Birmingham Festival 23, which is a lead on, uh, or which was an anniversary festival for the games that happened in the summer. Um, and that was a two part thing, really. The first part was to run that anniversary festival. But the backdrop to that was all sort of festival and culture legacy related. It was all about securing longer term legacy for culture from 2022 onwards. And that's really why I think I'm I'm around the table and why I'm still around in the city doing this thing. Um, I'm really interested in what we build on and how how that changes or how that needed to change how we identified in the first place. What that could be like in the future, I think there's a there's a lot to play for. Um, however, it's a very interesting time to be thinking about culture and leadership in the city. Um, and I'm sort of smiling and I can't see you all, but I think probably some of you are probably grinning as well. But over the last 48 hours. I think when you get news that's really specific to Birmingham, so apologies if some of you are not from Birmingham and this doesn't matter to you so much, but when you sort of get news about your, your, your city council and your leadership effectively being in some sort of crisis, that's when you really begin to reflect on the importance of leadership um, and it's been tested a lot. So I think living in a sort of or going through and working through very, very uncertain times to play back to sadly the, the time that Richard talked about earlier when we did um, a sort of post or well, COVID recovery sort of course. You, you just never think that you're gonna continually be in these uncertain times. But, but that for me is what leadership is really about. That's why you need leadership. Personally, I don't think you feel good leadership until it's needed. I don't think you always know when good leaders are around because you shouldn't feel like they're there all the time, but it's usually in crisis when we turn to and we look for good leadership because you need steering in some way. I also think that bad leadership is usually felt when it's not needed, but that's another whole story. I'm sure we've all got experiences with bad leadership maybe, um, or stuff we just feel isn't quite right. So a little bit about me. And I'm going to attempt to share, if it comes up, uh, a window, a screen. So, can somebody shout out if you can see a picture with blue? Yeah, it's all looking great. Thanks, yeah. Rachel. Fantastic. Okay. So, this picture, just that's me on the right not in the push chair, not the, not the guy. Um, that's me with my, covering my mouth. I think I'm about three and a half years old uh, with an ET jumper on. That sort of dates it for you. It's not a digital picture. That also dates it for you. Um, that girl to the left is my sister, Catherine, looking really nervous and, I don't know, a bit sad, really, I think. And then this thing in the front of us is a guy. I don't know if anybody knows what a guy is, um, but I'm from South Wales in Cardiff. Um, I grew up on a council estate in Cardiff, and, and we went out guying every year around around Hall around um, bonfire night and Halloween. And my dad used to get really frustrated that my mum would allow us to do this. So we made this guy, which is uh, you know it, to, to look like Guy Fawkes basically. Um, we made him, and then you you take him down the street, and basically people give you money for the guy. You say penny for a guy. So I don't know if anybody else did this growing up, but we did where I was from. Um, and my dad hated it because he thought it was basically us begging. He was like, you're going out on the streets, you're begging and it's embarrassing. Um, and the reason why I love this picture so much is just because I, I, my sister's totally not into it. I, on the other hand, I remember really being into this and I, I don't know why my mouth, I'm covering my mouth. Um, but at that age, I, I guess I felt like it, there was something about the hustle 
<laughs> so, so this is sort of like my hustle pitch, and I always feel like that doing what we do as producers or cultural leaders, you constantly feel like you're you're hustling for something, or you're trying to make something happen, and you're going out there with with who you are, and it's really the cold face of, I've done something, and I want you to recognise it, um, uh, and so that's what this picture is about. And then I'm just going to jump forward to another one. This is really blurry, sorry, and I'm not actually in this picture. This is a pseudo version of a picture that I had that I couldn't find. Um, and it was, it's of me, uh, there was a picture of me taken dressed up as a witch in school. I think I was about eight years old. It looked really like this and I can't find it. But where I remember I really wanted to, um, I really wanted to put something on in school. And I'd learned standing in front of the telly, the thriller dance, Michael Jackson's thriller, and, and, and I, and I got together a group of my class and I said to my teacher, I, I, we want to perform this, we want to do it. Um, and she was like, well, if you can get everybody to do it, then you can do it. And so again, I think there was sort of this nature of me going, well, if you're letting me do it, then I'll do it. Why not? So um, it, that was sort of my first experience, I suppose, in hindsight of saying I wanted something to happen and then making it happen and then standing in front of an audience or people that thought that was really good, that was great, and bringing people together. And I remember that feeling really, really good. So that's just a little bit about me. I should have stopped sharing now um, in the background. Hopefully you're still with me. So yeah. Yeah. that was my first taste of sort of a leadership story, I suppose. I wanted something to happen, and I'm sure you guys really want something to happen. And I think if you think about it hard enough, you probably will have your own experiences that go back to childhood, probably, because I think with all of this, something goes back to sort of your roots and your childhood, and, and it makes you who you are. So um, beyond all of that, obviously, that was a really, really long time ago. I did lots of other things, and I think coming into sort of more of a professional view, I've, I've always been really lucky. So since um, I went to university, I was the first person to go to university in my family and around me. I didn't know anybody else that went. Um, it was quite a bold move to do, and I moved to London. Um, and since then, I got a job straight away because I needed to make the money, and I got a job. And I was really lucky to have really great leaders around me. Um, and so, like I said, I didn't go on a formal leadership thing. I was so lucky to have really great leaders around me. One thing I did do when I got a little bit older, so in my 30s, um, I was asked, I sort of applied to do what was called a MOBO leadership, a fellowship leadership um, with the London Theatre Consortium. And it came in quite an odd time because by that point, I think people probably already thought that I was a bit of a leader and I was already doing it. And it put the ball in my court. It put the ball in my court as in it wasn't people telling me what to do. It was a group of people asking me what I would like to do with them. And I thought that was quite an interesting way of looking at leadership because leadership in my view and, and always has been interested in participation and uh, in education and learning and community as shown in some of those pictures that's that was my route into the arts i didn't come into this thinking i would be an artistic director and that's how i would be a leader it was about how i might facilitate or lead other people so the ball was very much in my core um and that was a real surprise to me and that was sort of maybe that was maybe now maybe about 10 years ago, maybe a bit, a bit, uh, maybe about seven to 10 years ago. Um, and I think with this process, that could be, that's the opportunity that's presented to you. You've obviously got a, a great opportunity to learn from people and go on quite a structured process. Um, but for the most part, I think all of this is about you. All of these opportunities about one, time to focus on you. I think they provide provocations for you to think about what, why you do what you do. And when do we ever get the opportunity to do that? Um, and to do the personal reflection. So not necessarily the reflection on your work, but the reflection on you. And I've always found that's probably the biggest benefit. It's not about your technical skills. It's about you understanding why you do what you do. I think it's a great opportunity to listen and learn from others and from your peers. I think it's an opportunity for you to make decisions also about how you want to present yourself to the sector. And I think thinking about diversity, that's a really important thing that we could talk about for a really long time. Um, and then the other point I would make is that I think during 2022 and, and even this year in the evaluation of uh, the cultural festival from 22 and thinking now what's just coming out of 23, what we identified is that we really don't have a problem in the city and region with, with diversity as a whole. 
um, the problem is that the pipeline isn't quite there. So when it comes to thinking about diversity and a di diversity in culture and the arts that we make and present, is we have diverse art artists everywhere. You know, artists that look different, sound different, that stories everywhere. Um, they look and sound like the city because they are they they are from the city and from the region. That's not the problem. We also have diverse audiences, so we know that if you put the right program on that diverse audiences will come out that look and sound like or attracted to those stories and to the artists making that work. Um, and there's loads of evaluation from 2022. If you haven't seen that, please do. But, but what we proved is that if you've got the program right, the, the, the diversity isn't really an issue anymore, actually. But the, because the pipeline isn't quite complete in that way without leaders. It isn't complete without producers, leaders, managers, who can smoothly bridge that gap with their own experiences and sensibilities and their view and lens on the world. So it, 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 because we've got this problem in the middle, which is, which is this, which is about um, cultural leadership, the pipeline is broken between being able to put together audiences and artists in the right way or in ways which are really fulfilling and impactful for everybody. Um, so th th there was a bit of a chat just before this where I suppose there's a question to you really and you can either put it in the chat or you can put your hand up or you can um, use it going forward which is to ask yourself whether you usually take part in things like this and then you decide that you don't need it or it's not for you and whether you're that person that comes along to something and then decides it's not for people like me or I can't do it. Um, and I think depending on your background, uh, and I've done this before as well, you sort of sometimes think, well, somebody else will do that. It's probably not quite the right shape for me and somebody else will do it. Um, and I guess my response to that will be well, to think about why you do that maybe and whether you'll do that this time, hopefully not. And whether you're thinking about other people, you're like, oh my God, they could absolutely and should be here. And to, to, to basically not to think that there's anyone else like you that will fill that gap. Like don't, don't be under the illusion that there is somebody else out there right now that can fill the gap in the shape that is exactly like you because that there really isn't. And that can feel quite pressure sometimes. That can feel like, um, oh my God, it's just me. And if I don't do it, then no one will. And some people can really retreat from that responsibility because leadership is a responsibility at the end of the day. But it's also completely joyous and um, and brilliant, I suppose, when you do make something happen and you do see the impact that comes out of the decisions that you're making um, for culture, because that's that's the thing that I think we're around the table for. Um, so I'm going to stop there because I'm sure I've gone over my 10 minutes. I'm really sorry about that. Um, but good luck, because I'm sure and I'm hoping that you'll go on this journey and experience. And I'm going to stick around for a little bit. So if anyone's got any questions for me, I'm more than happy for you to to put that in the chat. Uh, thanks for having me, Erica and Richard, and, and good luck, everybody. Thanks, Ray. That was really, yeah, um, inspiring. And you know what? Finding out having worked with you for nearly two years, did not know lots of those things. So really, really lovely um, to hear as well. <laughs> um, I'm going to move the pin. Um, so, um, yeah. Oh, don't know where I'm going next. I felt a bit emotional watching and um, listening to all of that stuff. So um, I'm going to hand over to Anthony to talk about some of the practicalities of um, the programme and kind of what, what, what we'll be going through. Um, so, yeah. Anthony, off to you. Cool. Um, let me get this up. Can, can people see that? OK, I'm just going to have to juggle a few things on my screen. Fab. Um, yeah, oh, thanks also, Ray. It was really lovely, actually. I think it's it's really interesting hearing it back and hearing about the way that we've been thinking about the programme and also the work that we did together on, you know, the sector development programme um, during the festival last year as well. And, and at that point, I think about there is so much diversity happening in multiple ways across the city and across the region. But one of the things that we've really experienced and seen is that actually it is those people that are um, making decisions or making or um, kind of understand the structures and the systems that um, where that diversity maybe isn't seen as, as much. And that's really what this programme is about. Um, and also kind of the way that the programme has been shaped um, and, and it's called Collective, but actually it is much more about this kind of partnership between between the people that are, are here on the screen. So a partnership um, between Culture Central, between people making work and the people that are taking part in this programme to be a collective together. 
Um, and really, it's it's an invitation as well um, to work together and to shape the programme uh, collectively. Um, so when we were first thinking about it as well, we were really aware, actually, there are lots of existing leadership programmes and really good leadership programmes that exist. Um, often they're either art form focused or they're for particular stages. And what we wanted to do was really think about, well, actually, um, these leadership programs are designed by people who are already in positions in leadership. Um, um, how do we create something that's really specific about working in the West Midlands, um, but that also is um, shaped and designed by the people who have lived experience of, of working here as well? Um, so our uh, our program has kind of been shaped entirely in that way. It's about looking at changing a place. It's about looking about changing a system and thinking about really what might be possible um, when those that maybe have traditionally been excluded from those kind of careers and roles are able to shape and redefine what leadership is, basically. Um, so let me move on to the next slide. Oh, that's not working. Um, so in terms of our history and why and why we're doing this and why we think we should be sort of wanting to do this with people as well. Um, as an organisation, we've gone through really significant changes and we've um, started new things within the region as well. So um, some examples of this are things like the Cultural Response Unit, which is where, you know, as, as an organisation and as a sector, we kind of completely opened up during COVID and said to people, there were all these massive shifts and changes and challenges really happening. Um, but how can we work together? How can we share knowledge and how can we um, empower each other to kind of do uh, more things or different things or work together in new ways as well? And the cultural response unit was a really good example of that. The feedback that we had from people were that how valuable it was maybe to be as a, either an individual or working in a smaller organisation, being able to connect with and speak to um different parts of the region or people working in other roles or directors of organizations in other places as well. So kind of that equity, I guess, across the, the cohort of people that were part of the crew was really valuable and, and the collective voice that came from that as well. Um, more than a moment, so the, the pledge for kind of react, um, action for the black creative workforce um, within the region as well was another kind of uh, flagship kind of uh, area of work for us that was kind of co-created with um, uh, Zeddy, with Elizabeth Lowell, um, and basically looked at how uh, what changes organisations needed to make and how organisations could sign up to and pledge their commitment to the black creative workforce and make change within the region as well. And we saw lots of really significant changes happening in terms of the content, um, in terms of board level, in terms of governance, all of those things happening within organisations there that we think is really important. Uh, Transforming Narratives for us was a really uh, big international programme, uh, which was... Uh, working and supporting uh, our artistic exchange between artists, practitioners and organisations in Birmingham, Pakistan and Bangladesh. And again, that parts of that were around uh, leadership um, and supporting people in leadership positions within um, those communities too. And then most recently, we've had um, the, the programme that we were just talking about, Convene, Challenge and Connect, um, which was our sector development programme in partnership with Birmingham 2022 Festival, that had a lot of other elements as well and um, that we worked with people make it work on too, to kind of uh, have roles around convening, so bringing the sector together and connecting, maybe uh, connecting freelancers and lots of individuals that were working within the sector that maybe didn't feel as connected to what was happening or weren't, uh, weren't as supported to do that but also challenging the sector to think about what changes they needed to make and uh, what the future should look like for them as well, what kind of what the development of the sector itself looks like. Um, so with this programme, um, there were, uh, and we've been shaping this with people make it work for a really long time and having lots of quite deep discussions about the things that felt important to us and the things that we valued. So um, one really key one for us is around challenging definitions of leadership. I think quite often we have quite a fixed idea of what that is. Um, and actually for us at Culture Central, it's not based on seniority, your role or your experience, but it's about the vision and the priorities that you have for the people and the places through your kind of creative practice. Um, so thinking about, it's not just about being a chief executive of a multi-million pound organization. It's about creating the, the type of leadership conditions that are valuable for you and are valuable for the communities and people around you as well. Um, another important area for us was around creating the conditions for creativity and culture within the region. And really, I think this is about kind of both thinking about the ambition, but also the innovation that's, that's possible within the sector. Um, and thinking about how those decisions are made. So really uh, exploring how, uh, who and how makes decisions about culture within the region and thinking about their role and relationship then to areas maybe like health, society or, or business and thinking about um, 
understanding those structures and, and the way that they work and how society is kind of shaping all of that. Um, we also, one thing that was really key for us and very early on we decided to do was co-create the kind of leadership curriculum. So we had lots of ideas about what the programme would look like. And then we actually took a moment where we said, let's stop. Let's not create all of this. Let's actually find out who the cohort of people are that are interested in doing this with this. Uh, and then design something together that meets kind of their experiences and their needs as well, as well as ours. Um, a really key area for us as well was around restorative and equitable practices. So this is really thinking about um, how important kind of care and well-being and healing is, I think, within within the programme. You know, we're aware that there are lots of challenges to working within the sector and to, to kind of working within culture um, as a whole. And actually, um, it's very important for us, although this programme is targeted at um, specific types of people that have been excluded from careers in the sector, um, it's not necessarily about them having to um, be pathologized or kind of be paraded or having to even sort of uh, reference that some of the inequities that they've experienced as, as working in the sector. So um, that was quite important for us. Um, the last other kind of few ones that I'll talk about are kind of that the program should be iterative, responsive and open. The program itself is across three years and actually we're using this first year really to test and work out uh, what, what should be happening in terms of the, the content and the way that the, the program is delivered. And our ambition is to build and, and grow it for year two and three, hopefully with some of the people that have been involved in the first year as well. And finally, I think I'm thinking about kind of sector change and, and disruption as well and thinking about the ways in which the sector does need to change um, and the ways that the people kind of in those, I suppose, leadership roles in the sector could change and adapt as well. But we're really clear that the change isn't necessarily, um, uh, that change isn't the priority or the focus of participants in collective. It's actually about the sector make, taking and making responsibility for that change as well. So structurally, um, there are essentially uh, six sessions that are happening. Um, all of the dates are up on the website, so I won't go into a lot of detail on this, this slide here as well that you can have a look at. But just to kind of say that um, we're taking a process that kind of looks at action, research or action learning um, at its core. So thinking about, again, collectively sharing experiences and knowledge and thinking about how we support each other to shape, develop and learn from the programme. Um, all of this is kind of bookended as well. This, I should say, is all being led by people to make it work. And this is being bookended with a lot of one-to-one -one kind of leadership progression sessions and reflection and uh, individual reflections at the end of the programme as well. I'm really aware of time, so I'm going to skip forward a little bit um, and not speak. Have I missed anything key out here? No? Fab. Um, so really quickly... Uh, and again, I won't go into a massive amount of detail about it, but we did a lot of thinking again about the types of people that this might be for. Um, so what we wanted really to focus on are people that are ambitious for culture within the region, who are excited about it and see the opportunities and want to support that kind of the innovation really, but that that's not necessarily about just being for themselves or their own practice. It's about having value to those kind of communities that, that Ray was talking about, the communities of people that live here in the region, it has to benefit them. Um, it very much it is for people that have been traditionally excluded from those careers and those leadership positions in the cultural sector. Um, and I'll touch more on that in a second. Um, also for people that work in the West Midlands or work with West Midlands based organisations. So there has to be some connection to what is happening or, or things happening here in the region. Um, it's not necessarily for people maybe that are thinking about working uh, working outside of the region or wanting to develop in that way um, explicitly. Uh, also, this is more focused on people that are already working within organisations, so it is targeted more towards employees. We recognise that people's employment patterns will probably look quite different. There may be freelancers that are looking at this, but um, this is mostly because we, we recognise that taking part in a programme like this needs a lot of support and time as well. And we think that is, um, this is very much part of our offer to organisations, funded organisations in the region. Um, if you are a freelancer, if you've got kind of different alternative models, that we can talk about that as well a bit later on. Um, spoken about some of these other points. Um, yeah, and, and for us as well, I think another part of it that's really important is wanting to understand how the sector works behind the scenes kind of this is a bit of an opportunity to kind of like almost look behind the curtain and see and understand you know how does arts council work what's its relationship to dcms for example what does all that mean and how does that mean um make decisions about where the money goes and and what happens basically so those kind of things about it and crucially being able to kind of deconstruct some of that as well or, or sort of um learn some of the speak that a lot of people in the sector know and have learned and don't always share very easily. 
Um, I won't go into a massive amount of detail about all of these various um, uh, different kind of uh, characteristics or identities, but essentially for us, it was really important um, that we prioritise this programme for people that have been excluded from careers in the cultural sector. Um, we use this language in a few different ways. Sometimes we talk about exclusion, sometimes we talk about people that are underserved. Um, but for us and, and with this programme, I think exclusion is quite an important word because it is a more active process and it places um, the kind of, it, it challenges the decision-making and the structures I think that exist within kind of recruitment and within the cultural sector as well. Um, as part of the application process, um, people don't need to kind of disclose or say anything really specific about which of these categories or characteristics that they um, identify with. Um, people will self-identify and there is no requirement as part of the programme that you have to talk about your experience in relation to this as well. You are all here as people that work within and lead cultural sector um, kind of activity. So although this is a key part of the application, it's not necessarily something that you have to kind of go into massive amounts of detail about if you don't want to. Um, and then the last few parts of this are um, we've put together a really hopefully straightforward uh, and simple application process. Uh, and what we've really wanted people to do is just rather than CVs or kind of uh, big kind of uh, applications, want to find out a little bit more about people's careers so far, what they've done in terms of work in the sector, the challenges maybe that they might have faced and things that they're particularly proud of as well. So it's kind of a synopsis of that. Um, also kind of why people would like to be on this program, why it feels right for you um, at the moment and about your motivations as well. About, you know, why, why does collective seem right maybe versus other things that you could be doing? Um, and the last question that we want to know is about why it's the right time for you now um, and how you'll be supported to be part of the program as well, how you will have, um, have the time and the space um, and the organisational space as well to kind of uh, be part of the program. The way that the application works is all online. Um, I'll talk more about the deadline in a second, but you can see the kind of the word counts or the video um, uh, links that you'd be able to uh, provide for this. Just a note to say as well, if people are thinking about um, an application, but are maybe struggling to think uh, or aren't able to maybe put it quite into words or would like additional support with writing it, you can get in touch with us. There's an email on the next slide that I'll show you and we can offer some one-to-one -one support with that as well, if, if people would prefer that and what people would like to talk it through. Um, so the deadline for applications is 10 a.m. on Wednesday, the 30th of September. Um, uh, there is uh, uh, an online form that you can fill in. It's all up on our website as well that you'd be able to see. Um, we recognise as well that people might be going through this and then kind of think, actually, I'm not sure that I, I'm ready for this quite now. Maybe next year I'd like to, or I'd like to find out just kind of what's going on. Uh, we have a programme called Connective, which is essentially kind of a cohort of people that are sitting alongside the programme, but in a more kind of um, observer way, I should say. Um, so yeah, our email address is at the bottom there. So if anyone's got any questions about it, that's it. Um, and I will stop talking. I've gone way over as well. I need to unmute. Thank you, Anthony. What we also didn't say, and I just realised, is about nominations as well. So many of you might be on this call who um, um, who who think, whilst we're talking about all of this, that you're going, I really know somebody who would really, really fit into this space, who would really, really benefit, who needs to be that. Um, and actually it was Charlene in our, in our team who just really re recognized that when we were talking through this process and talking through the, uh, the program, it's like, I, I might have not seen myself on this or might have talked myself out of, of, of being able to do doing this or not seeing myself in it. So actually, if other people can see that leadership, that capability, that potential, that all of the things that we've talked about, um, please, please nominate them. You can do it anonymously, as Richard said, on the Jamboard, but also we've got a form and what will happen is we will get in touch with them and invite them to apply and offer them some support or a conversation around that as well. So um, please, please do so. Right, just I'm trying to find my agenda, the joys of lots of different things. Now I knew I knew where we were. So we're gonna have a little bit of a panel discussion now. And um, I suppose just to um, delve a little bit deeper in, into some of the questions that, that some of you might have. But if you have got questions that you might want to think about either on the jam board or you want to put something in the chat if you don't if, if they're not anonymous, then feel free to do do that. So I'm gonna bring Charlene in and I'm gonna bring Richard in, I'm gonna bring Anthony. So I'm gonna try and multi-pin everyone. We're ready. Pin. Second. Pin, add pin, Charlene, add pin. I better do it myself as well, hadn't I? There we go. Oh, look. Um, so I think this is around what do we know about leadership, barriers, and challenges? 
and a bit for sort of the deep dives into the, the values and, and how we kind of came about the programme. Um, so I think, um, first off, um, how much of this is about individual support, collective action and systemic change is one of the questions. So Richard, I'm going to come to you for that one first, because I think we, we've spent quite a lot of time shaping that programme. And then Charlene, maybe over to you for some of your thoughts on that. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I think um, I think it's really important that we have a human centred approach to this programme. And that means that you um, you get what you need from being in this space. And that might be time. It might be positive examples of other people who are like you and have been on a leadership journey too, like Radine was talking about earlier. Um, it might be some new skills or some new it's a cultural capital, you know, connection to people beyond those that you know already. Um, it might be, so I think it's really important that we centre each person who's on the programme. We, we make sure that the programme is supporting them as individuals. And I think we also recognise, don't we, that many, that the, um, the cultural sector uh, as the UK society as a whole is system systemically um, racist and classist and um, uh, sexist and um, uh, and um, has created a hostile environment around those with migrant experience and hostility um, around uh, people who are trans or have other um, identities. Um, so um, our job isn't to fix all of that, is it? But I think it is to say, if you're trying to fix some of those things, what in addition do you need? Um, so if you're working to create different conditions for yourself and others, what else is there that we can do together? And what does a collective allow that might be, um, that might supercharge some of the amazing skills, knowledge, relationships we've already got? That, um, that means that together we can do something that we can't do individually. So I think to that, the answer to the question for me is definitely about us as individuals. And then as, as, as we as individuals take on um, some sort of transformational impact or seek to work with others to change conditions, how can we make this program do that? And maybe some of that will happen in this year, but maybe some of it will happen with the second and third cohorts and the role that collectively that brings over a number of years, including the organisations that we're part of, as well as Culture Central and the other networks that we're all part of too. I'm muted. What are your thoughts, Charlene? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like this programme is probably more about looking at an opportunity to challenge our ideas around what leadership is. Um, often we associate leadership in relation to a seat at the table or a slice of the pie and look at all of those kind of systemic issues. Um, but I think when you look at it in those kind of finite ways, it limits us and makes us feel as though actually there isn't a space for me or I have to make something different or do something separate instead of being part of a collective of change. And I think a lot of us are probably leaders in some way, shape or form within our own spaces, but in able to really affect that kind of transformative change, we do need to tackle the systemic issues. But instead of looking at it at like it's a table or or a piece of the pie, like maybe we just reimagine the whole thing and dismantle the whole thing. Maybe it's not a table, maybe it's a campfire. And maybe you don't want to sit down and you don't want to use a chair. Maybe you are more comfortable maneuvering around the space in roller boots, you know, <laughs> or, you know, but, you know, or a cauldron, like we can all add a little bit of ingredients to something can make magic or be around of a campfire, not to be like a hippie or like be around there singing Kumbaya, but about, you know, adding like a little bit of kindling or, you know, like Ray Dean mentioned about going around with the guy, you know, throwing a little bit of log to make the fire bigger so that everybody can get a little bit of that warmth. And I feel that's what collective is trying to do is like just trying to reimagine what that space those positions look like and what the people around it look 
look like as well. So I think definitely for me, it is around challenging those systemic things. As a black woman, you know, I'm always going to see things through that lens, you know, especially when, you know, historically we've been kind of left out. So I'm really excited to see who comes on the program and what the ideas are and, you know, and just ways we can just see the system in a brand new way and, yeah, take it from there, really. Thank you. That's I, I love I love those analogies there. Um, yeah, absolutely great. Campfire. I'm doing that. Maybe that's the next team away day. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, so I think it's probably some people might be kind of questioning um, how we kind of thought about the approach and the target participant groups. Um, so I think, um, Anthony, I'm going to um, ask you for that question because I think that kind of was catalyzed. We, we'd started to do some thinking around it, hadn't we, as, as you and me at, at the team. And then we, we kind of we took a very different we took an approach going I mean, actually we shouldn't be just the one shaping this. Um, we should be looking at, at that a bit more broadly. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really difficult to say because I think it's kind of like what, what everyone's been saying so far. It's kind of like we recognise that there's a, something going a bit wrong or a bit strange maybe with, with what's happening um, in terms of, of leadership in the section. It feels like something that uh, we, we've all experienced or felt at, at different points. And, and we started to go, well, actually, like, you know what, as a sector, we've been talking about this for, I was going to say a long time, like it's been decades and decades and decades. So like why don't we just try and do something about it now and instead of being vague about what we want to do with this program let's be really specific and say um and recognize all of the stuff that richard was talking about as as well as kind of saying we could have created a leadership program um that might have like you know had a bit of you know like your your personal learning style or this or not, lots of different kind of things that make up those leadership programs but i think what charlene touched on was that that approach as well that's been shaped by us as a team and by the people that have worked on this which is going well actually we've got this um you know this the sector works in this way but why does it have to keep on working in this way we, we can actually change some things about it and i think what we started they started then to think about well as, as an organization you know culture central has networks and has members and has organizations that it works with across the region um and how do we leverage some of that with some of the people part in collective as well um so i think that's kind of where where all of this has come from and has been shaped to so far it's kind of uh, you know us also i think an important thing to say with this is it's about us organizationally changing um too and thinking also about uh, or recognizing sorry i should say that we probably won't always get these things right about the kind of changes that we need to see in the sector but we, we've got to try and we've got to kind of work on these things and the best way to do that is by expanding this kind of collective approach that we have. Yeah. Anyone else want to add to that, Richard, Charlene? Um, I feel like I want to just name check some of the other people who've been involved in thinking about the programme. So uh, Sandeep Mahal, who's um, our Director of Sector Change at People Make It Work and also works in the region at um, the RSC. So I know that um, some of you will know Sandy. And uh, Vicky Igbokwe Ozagi is our Director of Empowerment and Director of Echenna Dance. And um, both of those were also involved in our Culture Reset programme that Radine helped us develop and lead to. And so they've been thinking a lot about what, how do we create the conditions for, for us to thrive? And we're really inspired by an organisation some of you might know called Diverse City. Uh, which is um, works with uh, around performance with disabled people and um, staff. And um, they ask this question, what do you need in order to be your best self? And we think that's a great question to be asking in a leadership programme, but also of our organisations in order to enable us to thrive and lead and grow and be and, and have realise our potential. So, and Safina Jagger has also been helping us with this programme and bringing some of her experience of working across the region to shape some of that. So I think, you know, I wanted to name check them because I think that each of those people have, have direct experience that shaping what we are doing and also shaping the questions that we're, what we're not doing right shaping the questions we're asking of everyone in order that we remake the program each year over three years 
and that it's centered on and enabled by each group. And I think we imagine that participants in this year are likely to be speakers and contributors in next year and the year after. And, you know, there's that, there's that thing, isn't it, about creating our own conditions and creating our own, you know, br bringing the strength of community to some of those awful systemic challenges um, that make it even harder for them to be maintained. Yeah, and I, and I think that was what's really, you know, I think all of this is the is around this that all of these ideas that are shaped and actually kind of putting these into practice, isn't it? And collectively doing that, doing that change, and and thinking about how we all work together to 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 shift things. And um, yeah, amazing. Thank you um for that bit. I think we've kind of got to our the end of our sort of bit of this panel because we've got some time. Back, just back quickly, five minutes for Q and A, and Ray is still on the call and can still do that. Just want to check in if anybody, Charlene, Richard, Anthony, if you've got anything you want to add to that. No, um, but um, if there are, if people have got kind of questions or want a bit of a conversation with any of the team um, around that, um, then please just drop us a quick email and we're happy. We're, we're happy to have conversations about where people are at. So um, does anybody um, have any questions? I'm just going to quickly check the Jamboard to see if there is anything on there. I have no questions on the Jamboard. The jam so have we got any questions from... From anybody here? If not, we're just going to probably talk for another five minutes. So we're, we're much, we've been we're really interested to hear um, from anybody here. Anything that's kind of made them think about anything, anything that we may we should maybe be thinking about in our communication as well, or anything that um, we, any ideas about where we might be able to kind of you know, make sure we're getting this out to as many people as possible. It um, would be would also be helpful. So that's very quiet. Now they will turn the camera off. I bet you've just turned off. That's what it is, isn't it? <laughs> I don't have a question so much as a comment just around the um, the nominations process. I know that that's something that we think a lot about, that real equitable um, removal of barriers for, for people just to apply, just to know that that this is an option and, and um, something that exists. Um, yeah, I find that really interesting, that um, that that process. Um, I guess it'd be good to to understand, yeah, and, and any reflections on, you know, how how that's been and how that's I guess you know transformed and um, probably a reflective thing for for after this and after the process. But I think that's yeah, just really interesting. Yeah. I mean, Charlene, I don't know if you want to just reflect because you know ultimately that was a bit, that came from the team discussions, doesn't it? With people make it work and with our team around around that. So I don't know if you want to just reflect on why where that came from. Yeah, so I think it came from a place where it was like I think when I was thinking about what a leader is, and I think <laughs> Raydeen really gave a, an an amazing example about a good leader isn't somebody that you recognise when things are working really really well, but you really acknowledge when there's a bad leadership when things are going really badly, and I think there's this kind of we, what we what we're looking for is the kind of unassuming, unexpected, unentitled person who doesn't know that they're leading, but they're doing it. They're doing the work already and may not recognize themselves as a leader. And, but other people see that ability with, within them. So I think that's where it really came from. And I'm, I'm, I think we talked about how, when you use the term leader, leader, it attracts a certain type of person who, do you know what I mean? And it's that kind of, do we want people who are just like career driven or is it about what Rady mentioned earlier about, think about what you want to do, the change that you want to make and who you are and a little bit of that self reflection about what you're trying to do, not the skills that you can bring to the table, but what you're trying to do. So I think that's really important first and foremost. And then the skills develop over time, don't they? Like that's what the, the program's there for to help you build on those things. But it, but really it's more about empowerment. If somebody else tells you that you're doing a really good job and you can take this to the next level and elevate the change that you're trying to make, then that changes the game for a lot of people like mentally. So that's where that came from. And, and I think that's why 
um I feel like it's a it's a good shout like and if you know anyone you should definitely recommend them because even if they don't come on the program imagine what that does to their self-esteem just yeah. know that somebody thought of you in that kind of way and I think that's amazing but yeah that's where that came from yeah I completely agree and I guess within that um you know the pre the prerequisite of having a passion around arts and culture specifically but actually leadership those transferable skills across um I think that's an opportunity for, for somebody to step into that um that yeah that you've opened up which feels great thank you Al thank you Alice. Oh, Ray you're going to drop in yeah, sorry, I, it, you've just made me think of something that came up yesterday in the conversation about sort of cultural infrastructure as well. And when you're thinking about, so yeah, so so the 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 leadership bit, obviously, and everything that Charlene, Charlene's just said, but also if you're thinking about types of culture that you don't even see out there recognised, that are appealing to you and the people that you represent and the people that you, that your peers and your community, I suppose, for want of a better word, like therein is what Charlene was saying earlier about maybe you just need to look at changing the, the space entirely. So there's there's been a lot of talk at the minute, obviously there's cultural infrastructure and we, we sort of traditionally understand that to be theatres, galleries, museums, um, uh, concert halls, cinemas. Um, and then there's the, the stuff that's not recognised as physical infrastructure that, that sort of breeds culture as well, especially in the West Midlands, given who we are, what we look like, where we come from. Um, mosques, gurdwaras, community centres, churches, um, <coughs> um, gardens, parks, you know, all of these places where people convene and connect their culture. Faith is a big part of that. That came up a lot in the work we did in 22, about how does faith connect people? Um, in different ways where maybe there's an absence of, of artistic dialogue, actually, maybe there's a different dialogue that comes together. Um, and so there's also the invisible infrastructure that's not even there. And that can be things like faith, for example, or beliefs or um, um, habits, cultures, things that we do, like me going guying when I was two years old. I don't know if anybody else does that, but that's definitely something that's like deep rooted in, in my community that I did growing up right that, that that's what we did um, and there was a language around all that stuff so it's invisible um culture as well like don't like when you're trying to think about the stuff you want to do and you can't see yourself fitting that into something you can already see don't worry if you can't see it because I'm sure there is something there that you're able to apply yourself to um it just might not be visible and we need to sort that out that's the sector's problem and hence needing you in that space thank you ray i am realizing we're one minute over time so i think um, um let me have a quick look oh really great comment aid there around cultures we've done within the sector the children and families yeah and, and those are really interesting again some of the really interesting discussions that they in and we, we talk about people might be interested in the kind of creative health programs that are happening and how that kind of impacts around arts and culture there's lots and lots of kind of cross sector opportunities that, that um, can do that um there was a, one other question um corinne um I think if you see yourself in this program and you feel like that, that then apply, make an application. Um, and if you want to have a conversation, then then, then call, and let us know. Um, Anthony, you, I think you you've just messaged about uh, kind of some of the practical things just to get people know. So know what sort of time um is, is it really the time sort of constraints around it? Yeah. So we just had one question about uh, where is it on a practical note? How long is each session, and are they in person sessions every day? Um, so uh, at the moment, the first session we know is, uh, I think, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, all the other sessions might follow that similar format, but we sort of don't know until the first session has happened, basically. Um, similarly, uh, we know that in-person is, is really valuable, but we also know that depending on who is taking part in this, we may need to have hybrid setups and we may need to have all digital as well. So it's um, it's a little bit difficult to say at the moment because we don't quite know until we know who the cohort is and until we have that first session. Um, and also that we need to know kind of around access requirements and things as well that might shape some of those, those days. But um, we anticipate a full day uh, on each of those uh, weeks that we've got the dates for down there. 